There's a new uh, documentary, incredibly successful, very popular, called What is a Woman? In his documentary, Matt Walsh, who is part of Daily Wire, goes around asking individuals this simple question, what is a woman? Which, if you've been watching the news, it's a question that people are having a hard time answering nowadays. It used to be a simple question to answer. It used to be a black and white answer, what is a woman? But in the world in which we live, which has been by and large handed over to a depraved mind, this has been left open to interpretation. Whatever one thinks, or to a refusal to even answer the question, what is a woman? I haven't watched this documentary, and so I cannot say I recommend it to you. And I'm not interested today to answer the question, what is a woman? I want to answer a far more important question this morning, infinitely more important. And that is the question, what is a Christian? What is a Christian? What is a woman has a straightforward black and white right answer even if the world is confused today. What is a Christian likewise has a black and white right answer, even if professing Christians are confused about that today. What is a Christian? John has been answering this question in the epistle here, And he answers it comprehensively in the passage that we look at this morning. If you have your Bible and you haven't already gone there, go to 1 John 4, verses 15 through 21. 1 John 4, 15 through 21. Let me go ahead and read the passage. 1 John 4, 15 through 21. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him, He abides in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in Him. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as He is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because He first loved us. If someone says... I love God and hates his brother. He's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has not whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. What is a Christian? In this verse, in this passage, rather, we find five marks of a true Christian. Five marks of a true Christian, if you take notes. What is a Christian? This is a simple and yet profound question. And the answer to this question will lead to another more important and personal question for each one of us. Am I a Christian according to God's definition, not according to professing Christians' definitions of what a Christian is? Mark number one of a true Christian, we find in verse 15. A true Christian confesses Jesus. 
A true Christian confesses Jesus. Verse 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. That God abides in a person and that the person abides in God is one of John's favorite expressions of genuine saving faith. The word to abide means to to continue with or to live in. That's what the word to abide means. And so for someone to be in God and for that person to be indwelt by God means that they have unity now. There's union with God. There's fellowship with God. And that means salvation. Because no longer is that person separated from God because of their sins. No longer is that person hostile to God and God hostile to them. No longer is there enmity between that person and God. Because Jesus Christ has broken down the wall of enmity between that person and God, reconciling the sinner to God. And so for a person to be in God, the God to be in the person is for the person to be saved, to have eternal life. And what is the evidence that a person abides in God and God in them? Well, look at what John says. Whoever, be they young or old, rich or poor, man or woman, barbarian or Greek, Jew or Gentile, person with the most wicked past who has committed the most filthy sins, Or a person who grew up in church has a churchy past and who has learned how to play the role of a Christian. Whoever, anyone, John says, who confesses Jesus is the Son of God has salvation. To confess means this. This is what the word confess means here. To confess means to openly acknowledge. It means to publicly declare to publicly declare before people. A person who is saved declares publicly, openly, that Jesus is the Son of God. Not just any Jesus. Jesus was a very popular name back then. In fact, some manuscripts say that the man who was released in exchange for Jesus Christ was also named Jesus. Jesus Barabbas. And so if that is right, it would have been kind of this option. Which Jesus do you want? Jesus the Christ or Jesus the murderer? It is the Jesus who was born 2,000 years ago in Nazareth and who became a Jewish rabbi and who died on a cross. That is the Jesus that must be confessed that He is the Son of God. And notice this speaks both to His humanity and to His deity. Jesus, the historical person, that is his humanity. Son of God, that is his deity. And so a person is to confess that Jesus is truly man and truly God, that he is the very image of the invisible God, the exact representation of his nature. And that all that is true of God the Father is true of God the Son. That this is the eternal God. Jesus said, the Father and I are one. I and the Father are one. And if the Jesus that someone believes in is a mere man, a mere prophet, a created God, a demigod, a good rabbi, a man with some good advice, that person has a Jesus that does not save. That person is on his way, on her way to perdition. One must confess, as Peter confessed in Matthew 16, 16, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And a denial of the deity of Christ is a rejection of God's Son, and a rejection of God's Son is a rejection of God the Father. John already made that point in 1 John 2, 23 where he says, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. 
And so you must believe in all of who Jesus is if we are to be saved. And you must not only believe that unto salvation, but then you must openly confess it before men. You must acknowledge it before people that this Jesus, he is God incarnate. In Romans 10, 9 through 10, the Apostle Paul said this, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And by the way, to confess Jesus as Lord is inseparable from confessing him as the Son of God. Those two go hand in hand. Confessing Jesus as God, as the living God and the Son of God, is to say that he is Lord of my life. It is to to confess and to declare allegiance to this Jesus, that he is now the master of my life, that I'm following him, that I no longer have authority over my own life that I will obey him and follow him who died for me. In the Roman Empire, Caesar would claim to be a son of God. And people would be forced, Christians in those days, to say, Kaiser Kurios, Caesar is Lord. And whatever Christian would not do that, would be executed. Because as believers, we understand that Jesus has supreme authority, not man. And in the face of opposition, and in the face of persecution, and in the face of death, these saints would not do that. And they would say, Jesus, Kurios, Jesus is Lord. And you would die. And so, For Jesus to be the Son of God is for Him to be the Lord of a person's life, the Master that must be confessed. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if you have believed in Jesus Christ, you will not keep that to yourself. You know, we often hear, we we can talk about anything, just not politics and religion. Well, you can keep your politics to yourself if you want, but faith in Christ is not a private matter. It's not something we we keep secret. Jesus himself said a a failure to confess him before men is essentially equivalent of denying him and it results in a denial of him, that person, day of judgment. Well, he will reject you. As Henry read in Matthew 10, 32 through 33, Jesus said, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. And so there is no fence sitters when it comes to to God, to Christ. You're in or you're out. You're for or against. And that's what John has in mind. Whoever confesses Jesus as the Son of God, has salvation. What's the opposite? Whoever does not confess is lost, still separated from the living God. You're either for Christ or against Christ. There is no neutral zone. And someone who is ashamed of Christ and who will not confess Christ before men in no likelihood is not saved. Not a true believer. Deny Christ, he will deny you. Now, to bring some balance, this does not mean that if we have failed in the past to confess Christ before men, that we are not saved. That does not mean that, because we can't say that, because Peter denied Jesus Christ, openly denied him, rejected him, did not confess him, right? But what's the difference? Peter repented, and he turned to Christ. And his life was marked out by a continual, persistent confession of Jesus Christ. That's the idea. That's the idea. Do you openly confess Christ before men? Or do you, do you hide Christ in front of certain 
relationships? Do you hide Christ in front of certain family members? Do people at work know that you are a Christian? Does your family know that you are a follower of Christ? In John 12, 42 through 43, it says this of, of certain rulers. Nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Fear of man cannot keep us from hiding Christ. We are not called to be men pleasers, but God pleasers. And if you bring up Christ with that person and you lose that relationship, fine, so be it. But you'll have the approval of men, of God. You'll have the approval of God. You'll have God. We must confess Christ openly, boldly. I, I was online the other day, and I don't know what site it was on, but this little icon came up with these dark shades and like a hat that, you know, like a, what are those called? The tiny top hats? Kind of like what? It made me think of Anthony when I saw it. And I was like, when did he get his own icon? <laughs> but the option was, do you want to go incognito? Do you want to surf the web in kind of like a hidden domain? Sign out of your domain so that you can serve the web and do whatever you want without people tracing it back to you. I don't know how that works. Incognito. Right? A hidden identity. There is no such thing as an incognito Christian. There is no such thing as an incognito Christian. A person who will never confess Christ is a person who does not abide in God. And if you read what Henry said, the context in which Jesus said that was the fear of man. Don't fear man who all they can do is kill the body, not the soul. Fear God who can kill the, the body and then throw the soul in hell. We cannot be men pleasers. And if there's a relationship you have where you have an op open door, an opportunity to confess Christ, confess Christ. Confess Christ. We've all failed. But there's repentance. There's forgiveness. Thomas Kramer was one of the early English reformers in the days of Bloody Mary, Mary I. And she received her nickname by the reformers because of the many uh, Christians that she massacred for defecting from the Roman Catholic Church. And Thomas Kramer was made to recant his faith in the true gospel. And he was made to sign his recantation, which means his denial of the faith. And he did. But he still got the death penalty. He was still going to be burned at the stake. But Mary, Queen Mary I, gave him an opportunity to recant or, or to, to make his recantation public before he died. So she gave him one final sermon eventually, essentially. And Thomas Kramer went and he addressed the crowd and this was to kind of throw cold water on the Reformation. And he said this, I recant my recantation. And this hand will be the first thing to go into the fire because this hand signed the denial of my Lord. And as he was burned, he held true to his word. And he held out his right hand to be burned before his whole body caught flames. There's mercy when we fail. But we must be marked out by an ongoing faithful confession of Jesus Christ. A true Christian confesses Jesus. Number two, the second mark. A true Christian has believed the gospel. First half of verse 16. A true Christian has believed the gospel. Verse 16, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has 
for us. And the we here is Christians. We have come to know and have believed the love of God. Well, what love is John talking about? Go back to verses 9 and 10 of this chapter. That's where we find the love that he's talking about. 1 John 4, 9 and 10. He says, By this the love of God was manifested in us, that He has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so this is the love John has in mind, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this encompasses all of who Christ is. Not just Jesus the God-man, but the virgin birth. The sinless life of Christ. The substitutionary death on the cross. The burial. The resurrection. And that is what a person must believe. That is what the love of God is. That He gave it all so that sinners might be forgiven by faith in Him. But notice John says this. We have come to know and believed. There's one thing to know something. It's another thing to believe it. Have you believed the gospel? You see, many people know the gospel intellectually. They've read it, they've heard it, they know it, but they don't believe it. It has no benefit for them. It's not a saving action for them. No faith. But do you believe Jesus the Christ is the Son of God and that He died on the cross for your sins? This is personal. Do you believe that it is by faith in Him and Him alone, not faith and works, not faith and religion, that you're saved? Do you believe He rose again on the third day, having put death to death and having paid for all your sins fully, completely, forever? Do you believe that? If you believe, John says, you abide in Him, He abides in you. You have eternal life. Well, how can you know that? Because it is a work of God in the person that enables them to believe. Only God can move a person from knowledge to faith. 2 Corinthians 4.6 for God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So why do you believe the gospel? Do you realize that you believe that a 33-year-old Jew who was a carpenter by trade created the universe? And that he holds it by the power of his word? And that because you believe that He died on a cross, was buried and resurrected, that you have eternal life and are forgiven of all your sins? Why do you believe that? Only by God's grace? But to the world, what is it? Foolishness. Well, that's a foolish message. This guy created the world, the universe, in six days? Nonsense. The question is, have you believed? And not only that, are you believing? John 3.16, God so loved the world that whoever believes in Him will not perish, have everlasting life. The word believes in John 3.16 is a participle, which is whoever is believing in Him, ongoingly. It's one thing to have said, I believed in Jesus in 2001, I gave my life to him, I'm saved. That's not the question. The question is, are you believing right now? Are you living according to that faith right now? And so we can't be always relying upon a past experience or decision. The Bible always places the emphasis on the here and now. Am I being sanctified now? Am I believing in Christ now, today? Am I growing Am I in the same place I was two years ago, spiritually speaking? If I am, that's a red flag. We need to be growing in our faith. Am I believing in the gospel? Are you resting in Christ alone? Is he your only hope? A true Christian believes the gospel. 
It's that belief that then leads to confession, confessing Christ. Number three, a true Christian abides in love. A true Christian abides in love. Second half of verse 16. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Once again, John makes for the second time the emphatic statement, God is love. This is his nature. This is what motivated him to send a son to die on the cross for sinners. And it's very simple here what we find. If God is love, okay, if God is love and God abides in you, then the love of the God who is love is going to extend and pour out of you and extend to others because he indwells you. Fruit of the Spirit, love. And that's going to extend primarily to God, which is the first and greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But it's also going to extend to other people, to believers and even to unbelievers. Notice that the object of our love, however, is not specified in this verse. It's simply stating that love will be our operating principle in life, in all relationships. And if we abide in love, live in love, operate in love, we can be sure that we abide also in God. Why? Because the only way we could ever love that way is if God abides in us. It's a supernatural love. We do not love God naturally. The Bible says no one seeks after God. No one is good. No one is calling out to God. And so to love this God, the biblical God, it's supernatural. That's a God-given love. John made this point in 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. A true Christian abides in love. Number four, a true Christian has no fear of judgment day. A true Christian has no fear of judgment day. Verses 17 and 18. Look at verse 17. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. And so the words by this point us back to verse 16, okay? What John is saying here is that when we love in this supernatural way, with this supernatural love, we can have assurance that we belong to God and that our sins have been forgiven by the blood of Christ on our behalf. And therefore, as a result, we stand in confidence on the day of judgment when all believer, unbelievers are brought to the judgment throne of God to be judged for every single one of their sins. Now when John says love is perfected in us, what he's not saying is that we can love perfectly. As long as we are in the flesh, in this body, our love will be defective. It would be flawed. We fail to love often. All of us. But the one who loves as a lifestyle in this way, his love is perfected in him. The word perfected here means complete, mature. It's a mature love, not a perfect love. A love that persists. It's a love that gets back up when it fails and perseveres. When we see this type of love in our lives, John is saying we can have boldness, confidence in the day of judgment. And John continues, because as he is, so also are we in this world. He refers to Christ in this text. And there's some debate as to what John is actually stating in this verse. But, but I take the, the position that, that many uh, theologians take, commentators, that, that what John is saying here is that just as Jesus, who is the righteous one, can stand before God in heaven without fear of any judgment because of his perfect righteousness, so can we, who are his children, who are in Christ, 
covered by his perfect righteousness, even while we are in this world, therefore have no fear to, to, to stand before God in judgment. In other words, because the Christian is in Christ, covered by his perfect righteousness, judgment day is a non-issue for him or her. It's of no consequence because he has been forgiven. And John says, as he is right now, so also are we in this world. Not will be, but we are. At the same time, I believe that this truth extends into the reality that we are to be Christ-like in this world. We have been predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ. And so we are to ongoingly reflect Christ, and as we do that, we have confidence that we abide in God. 1 John 2.6 The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. If we're saved, Romans 8.1 says, there is now no condemnation for us in Christ Jesus. That's the whole idea. John elaborates then in verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. And the fear in view here is the fear of judgment day. It's not just a fear of anything. It's a fear of the day of judgment. And it's not talking also, neither about the, the reverential fear that we ought to have for God, as a child reveres or fears his father. That's a good fear. This is fear of judgment. Perfect love, John says, casts out fear. It, it literally means it throws it out the door. And so here's the idea. Fear of judgment day cannot coexist in the believer with a love for God. Those two things cannot coexist. They cannot be in you. You cannot love God and at the same time fear His judgment in the sense of eternal punishment. Why? Because fear involves the punishment and, and, and the love cast out the fear. And so the one who fears, John says, has not been perfected in love. One commentator said this. He put it this way. When the realization of God's love for us in Christ penetrates our minds and spirits, then we are perfected in love so that fear of God's judgment is removed. When you come to realize what God has done for you in Christ Jesus, forgiving all your sins, removing all your sins, fear is no longer present. Because the Son of God has been judged on the cross. And so here's the main point. If you fear judgment day, it's possible that you're not saved. If you fear judgment day, it's possible you're not saved. Because God's perfect love in Christ removes that fear. That's what John is saying here. In Romans 8.15, Paul said, You have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, it could be at times that we fear judgment because we're failing to love people and God as we ought to love, and so we, we begin to doubt and to fear. But the main idea that John has in this text is that if you have this fear, and it's a persistent fear, then you're not born again. Your sins have not been forgiven. And you need to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. And when you do, your sins are washed away and everything is replaced by an experience of God's love, peace, and joy. But for those of us who do believe, John reminds us in verse 19, we love because He first loved us. You see, our love for God, our love for the brethren, our love for people in general is evidence of eternal life but we can't go on thinking 
that we loved first, that we loved by our own accord or will. You love because God loved you. We have no reason to glory or boast. He is the initiator of love. And were it not for the fact that God loved you first, you would never love God. You would never love Christians. But thanks be to God, He loved us first. And this love, by the way, didn't begin in time. It began in eternity past. He set His love upon us. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1 and verse 4. And so this ought to lead us to a heart of gratitude, humility, heartfelt devotion to the God who loved us and and gave Himself for us and indwells us forever. But it also reassures us that our salvation is sure because He is the initiator of our salvation and therefore it will not fail. It all depends upon His love for us. Our love is weak. His love is perfect, everlasting, and strong. And so a true Christian does not fear judgment day. Number five, and finally, True Christians love Christians. True Christians love Christians. Verse 20 and 21. Look at verse 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. These two final verses are very straightforward, easy to understand. Logical conclusion. You can't say you love God and hate the people of God. You can say it, but John says you're a liar. You're a liar if you say I love God and don't love the people of God. Why? John says here, because if you can't love the brother that's right in front of you and that is born of God and then dwelt by God Himself, how can you possibly love the God who you do not see? We see God in each other, as we learned last week. We see God in each other as we love one another. And so the false teachers that had come to these churches, they claimed to love God, but they hated believers. But this applies to anyone here this morning, to anyone watching online. Whoever claims to have a vertical love, but no horizontal love, is a liar. Each believer is a child of God. So we don't want to be those people who say this, I love Christ, but not the church. I love Christ, but not the church. When Saul of Tarsus was on his way to Damascus and he was confronted by Jesus Christ, he said this to Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? Now Saul was going to persecute the church. But Jesus says, no, why are you persecuting me? To persecute the church is to persecute Christ. To love the church is to love Christ. To love God's people is to love God. Very simple. So we love one another because it's logical, and finally, because it's commanded in verse 21. It's commanded. Verse 21 says, And this commandment we have from Him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love Me, you will keep My commandments. What are the two greatest commandments that He gave? To love God and to love neighbor. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets, Jesus said. And so true Christians love Christians because Jesus commands us to love Christians. And so how do we do that? How do we do that? Let me give you some points of application here, and we'll end here. How do we fulfill this command to love? Number one, love forgives, even when forgiveness is undeserved. 
That's Christ's example. Love forgives even when forgiveness is undeserved. Ephesians 4.32. Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Number two, love shows gracious tolerance for others in the body of Christ. Love shows gracious tolerance for others in the body of Christ. We have to realize that the church is made up of different kinds of people with different backgrounds, different struggles, different temperaments, and so we need to be gracious to one another. Ephesians 4, 1 and 2. Ephesians 4, 1 and 2. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Number three, love uh, preserves unity in the body of Christ. Love preserves unity in the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, 3 being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. It's Ephesians 4, 3. 4. Love regards others as more important than itself, than oneself. Love regards others as more important than oneself. Philippians 2, 3 through 5. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Five, love lovingly calls out sin. This one's often neglected. Love lovingly calls out sin in other believers. Luke 17, 3. Jesus said, Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If we see someone sinning in the church, the loving thing to do is to approach them one-on-one and to show them from the Scriptures where they have gone wrong so that they might repent. Six, love forgives and forgives, and forgives. Love forgives, and forgives, and forgives. Luke 7, 4. If your brother sins against you seven times a day, and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. That's hard. Love forgives, and forgives, and forgives. One more. Love provides for the physical needs of others. Love provides for the physical needs of others. Matthew 25, 25 through 26. And this is, by the way, in the context of Judgment Day when people come to Christ. This is the reason Jesus says they're coming into heaven. Okay? Not the reason, but the evidence that they were saved. He says, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. That's not himself. That's not Jesus talking about himself, but loving his people. When you give a believer a cup of cold water to drink, you're giving Christ a cup of cold water to drink. And so love is sacrificial, friends, saints. God's love was sacrificial love. He gave it all. It was costly, and he requires that of us. And so what is a Christian? A Christian confesses Jesus is the Son of God. A Christian believes the true gospel, not only knows it. A true Christian abides in love. A true Christian does not fear judgment day. And a true Christian loves the people of God. Are you a Christian? Let's pray. 
Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this epistle. As we've closed out chapter 4 and look forward to chapter 5, closing out this epistle. And thank you that you've instructed us so much on what is the evidence of true salvation. You've not left it up for guesswork or interpretation, but that you're clear on what you expect of us, that you're clear on what the evidence is. And I do pray that all of us in the power of the Holy Spirit would be able to fulfill the great commandment of love. For those who are here who do not know you or are listening, may you be pleased, Lord, by the power of your Spirit to birth them into the kingdom and grant them repentance and faith in Christ, forgiveness and eternal life. And we pray this all in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.